everyone, I'm Natalia Bilbao, and here's what's happening in LA this week. Governor Gavin Newsom and LA County Supervisor Hilda Solis rolled up their sleeves for a recent event. The press conference and cleanup was to help bring awareness to the growing problem of litter in public spaces and to announce the new funding allocated to fighting the issue. We are all of the same mind. This is the most beautiful state in our democracy, but it's not as clean as it should be. Well, today is, uh, is a momentous day for us. It's a critical day for us because this is the most comprehensive effort the state has ever undertaken to clean up the public spaces in the state. We're not only going to invest a billion and a half dollars to do this kind of work, but we're also going to put people to work. As President Solis said, 15,500 jobs will be created through this initiative. Formerly homeless, at-risk youth, kids coming out of the prison system and adults, young adults looking for opportunities. We're going to give them opportunities. Estoy muy agradecida de estar aquí hoy día con el gobernador que, que nos está apoyando con fondos a limpiar estos áreas que están muy impactados donde vive gente y también donde hay mucha basura. No solamente en el condado de Los Ángeles, pero en todo el estado. También va a reparar fondos para hacer y criar trabajos para las personas muy impactadas que viven por acá. Roughly four or five years ago, we were spending about 60 million dollars on cleaning up litter across the state of uh, California. Within the last two years alone, we've gone up to $110 million annually to clean up litter across the state. Part of what's exasperated the challenge for us, no doubt, is the fact that the pandemic hit as well. We saw up to nearly 40% a 40 increase uh, in, in trash being generated across the state. And a lot of that litter, that trash that's being generated, unfortunately, ended up on a lot of our right-of-ways. You know, I think a lot about our country and how divided the country is. And at the end of the day, people coming together and getting out, rolling up their sleeves quite literally and doing work side by side, other fellow leaders in their community. Volunteerism, service, I think is the closest approximation to a universal answer to so many of the damn problems we face. That's the spirit we want to bring back in the state, and I hope this country. This is one of two ribbon cutting for Supervisor Solis this month. We'll see her supporting energy efficiency with a beloved local market later in the program. And while Governor Newsom promises sweeping changes in resources against littering on a state level, there are folks in District 14 who are showing a little TLC to one of their own local landmarks. Channel 35 was there to catch the Heidelman Stairs cleanup. Take a look. We were able to come and help beautify the Heidelman Stairway in a way to demonstrate how this community has been resilient against the COVID-19 pandemic. We were able to come together as a group and do this project. Over the years, we've worked on this stairway, but as soon as we clean it up, paint some of it, take care of it, it resorts back to being a eyesore. We're working in a partnership to do a big renovation of these stairways. The idea came from Dulce. She's lived here for a while. She saw the staircase needed some beautifying. Se usaban antes para la comunidad las usaba para ir al trabajo, para agarrar el bus, porque si no las usan, la comunidad tiene que ir casi a una milla alrededor para llegar a su casa. Entonces, no las usaban porque había mucha basura, no las usaban porque había mucho graffiti. Volunteers in the community, the neighbors came out and helped us uh, cut the grass down, make sure it was a little bit more clear the area. The water drainage on the side of the, of the stairs was completely covered. Some areas you couldn't even, you wouldn't even know that it's there. A lot of people talk about asking the city to do X, Y, Z to make changes, but this entire project is all local people deciding to take their own time, to actually make a lot of these things happen and they're able to transform something that some of them didn't even know about and now a lot of people are going to use and who knows it could be a destination a landmark 
Team Cedillo hosted a wellness fair at the Westlake Community Garden in District 1. Attendees were treated to free books, groceries, and haircuts. And for those who still needed to get vaccinated, healthcare providers were on site with free doses. No waiting required. We are at the Westlake Community Garden. This community took a very hard hit with COVID. I'm here today to get my second vaccination shot. It was close in the neighborhood. I live in the neighborhood, so it's just right around the corner. Convenient for me. They can take advantage of different programs. Whether you're, you know, an immigrant or a person that lives here, you know, we all we all try to come together, and and I see that the Los Angeles City and the county is doing a great job of that because not only that they you know they help the community, you know, we you know we live here. There's always events here, uh, whether it be a wellness fair or whether it be just coming out here and uh, you know doing some gardening with the com with the community. Es importante porque así también nos ayuda también un poco de los que puedan dar pues. Councilmember Kevin DeLeon and Union Station Homeless Services kicked off summer early with a barbecue for the people living at the Tita Inn. The former hotel is one of more than a dozen properties purchased by the City of Los Angeles to provide interim bridge housing for unsheltered residents. Here's that story. Y por eso celebramos unos platos de, de, de carne asada y de pollito y al pastor y con frijoles y, 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 y arrocito y, y, y salsa para toda nuestra gente indigente celebrando un nuevo día, un nuevo este, amanecer, eh, un nuevo este, camino que ojalá si Dios quiere este es un camino de recuperación para nuestra gente aquí en el Sereno. We provide both the housing and services to help support those people who have experienced homelessness. So once people move into the hotel here, this is just interim or bridge housing. Our staff work with them to provide them the supports they need to stabilize their lives and then to move on towards permanent housing and reintegration into community. That's exactly why the city of LA purchased these former hotels to give you another chance, an opportunity to get your life back together so you can pursue your dreams. Just being back in the room, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful, you know. Um, I'm not cold anymore. Um, we get to watch, you know, TV and they feed us every day. Everyone enjoy the tacos, the carne asada, pastor, frijoles, arroz, y the pollo. This is our day to celebrate. This is our day to say we, we count, we matter, and this is a success. And while Councilmember DeLeon helped to serve up carne asada in District 14, Councilmember Kern Price cut the ribbon on a new multifamily bridge home site in District 9. Mr. Price was joined by LA County Supervisor Holly Mitchell for the grand opening of Lillian Mobley Family Housing. Take a look. Today I'm thrilled to present the Lillian Mobley Family Housing uh, Project. This is a, a really a model facility and as you take a look around and uh, you go upstairs and go inside and you see outside here it's obviously kid friendly and pet friendly. We want it to be a place of comfort uh, and a place that the folks can call home uh, to get off the streets. Far too many families in Council District 9 and Supervisorial District 2 um, are in need of beautiful transitional housing just like we see here. The fact that it's named for Lily Mobley, uh, a true mother of our community who uh, was a, a, a founding member of any number of organizations and really poured her heart and soul into the needs of this community is just, I think, icing on the cake. This space is just very befitting. Mrs. Mobley would often recite Grandma's hands. She would say, we wake up early in the morning to gather the mud and the straw, 
to give to the kids, to build a future, to build the bridge for a better tomorrow. This location is a great example of how smaller sites can be modified and tailored to specific program and population needs by creating a pet friendly space for kids to be kids, for parents to easily access critically needed case management services, and for staff to have a smaller setting, which can be uh, critical in building the trust and rapport and the close connections with the families that are imperative for their process. This program has shown me that they are helping people like me and others in this, tight, in our, this time of our lives, especially in a pandemic where a lot of us are still trying to find homes. We're still trying to get jobs and they are making it a way for us to be able to talk to people so we can get that second chance that we all, all of us are really working hard to get. We're excited about projects like this. And so I think uh, this could be a real model for what happens in other parts of the city. Lillian Mobley has been called the most accomplished and successful community activist South Los Angeles has ever had. She is credited with helping to establish Martin Luther King Hospital, the first major hospital in the South Los Angeles neighborhood. Council District 14 comes together for a community cleanup. Council President Nuri Martinez honors activist Angel Aviles, and Council Member De Leon holds an impromptu swearing in. These stories up next on City Beat. Council Member Kevin De Leon has partnered with the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement to help with cleanup efforts in his district. Within the perimeters of this area, which is Cincinnati Street here, right in front of the Boys and Girls Club, we, this is a large neighborhood, Ball Heights, right here. So we're targeting our neighborhoods within an eight block radius in this immediate area. With brooms, shovels, gloves, and trash bags, it was a very productive day. Community volunteers, LCLAA and Councilmember De Leon came together to clean and approve public spaces that have been neglected, vandalized, or misused. This neighborhood cleanup in CD14 was more than a one-day event. It is a commitment to keeping trash and other waste, graffiti, and neighborhood decay under control. For more information on the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, visit their website at lcalaalosangeles.org. Angel Aviles is a fixture in Latin pop culture. She is an author, transformational life coach, speaker, and founder of the lifestyle brand Living Ferb. Angel was recently honored with a Certificate of Recognition for National Mental Health Awareness Month from Council President Nuri Martinez. In 2020, Angel released the inspiring memoir entitled Too Happy to be Sad Girl, a nod to the iconic character she portrayed in the 1993 cult classic film Mi Vida Loca. Too Happy to be Sad Girl is a self-help book that does more than share Angel's profound journey and personal experience with depression and anxiety. Angel's book aims to empower the Latin community to develop more dialogue about health and wellness. Councilmember Kevin De Leon took great pride to swear in a new attorney at law, Felipe Garcia, for the city of Los Angeles. Felipe Garcia took the oath in a small yet intimate ceremony that is his final step to the privilege of practicing law. Councilmember De Leon recognizes that attorney at law Garcia will protect and defend all rights while providing access and a voice to those who need it the most. Being one of the barsters now newly admitted in California, we, you know, I hope to bring more access to those folks who generally go underrepresented. For more information, visit councildistrict14.com. So the mask mandates are easing, the national vaccination rate is up to 36% of the population and rising, and rush hour is returning to our freeway. It seems like things here in LA are slowly getting back to normal, right? But when will LA's tourism industry start to see a comeback? A beautiful afternoon in the city of Los Angeles. Makes you want to kind of get out and explore. Well, there's a couple people here this afternoon that will tell you where you should go and how you can enjoy it. I'm delighted to be joined by Adam Burke and Don Lu. The outlook 
is really good for travel and tourism. I mean, here we are, we're excited about being out, but the pandemic really kind of shook the foundation of the entire industry, didn't it, Adam? So while certainly we're, we're gonna have a long road ahead of us, there's every reason to be optimistic about what the rest of this year is gonna look like. But to your question, absolutely. If you look back to 2019, before the pandemic, travel and tourism had become the fourth largest employment sector in LA County. In fact, we had over 544,000 Angelinos who were employed in tourism-related careers. Um, beyond that, visitors to Los Angeles spent $26 billion in our local businesses. And even in terms of what it did for residents of LA, because guests staying in hotels pay a transient occupancy tax, a hotel tax, that contributed over $315 million to the city's general fund, supporting essential services like streets and sanitation, fire, arts and cultural programming, so if you look back at 2020, um, it's impossible to overstate just how devastating it was for our industry. Um, but honestly, Maria, the thing that I find most heartbreaking about it is in our sector, we saw job losses of one in three. Oh, no. So that's about 165,000 Angelinos who were displaced during the pandemic. That is then. Now we need to kind of, as you said, look forward. What's happening when it comes to LA tourism that is giving both of you a reason to be a little bit more optimistic? Recently, we've heard that almost 75% of people have travel plans for the summer. And so we know that the LA area is one of the places they wanna, they wanna visit and we're gonna do what we can to make sure that they're welcome here. Uh, I'm creating an in, I'm creating a mythical family that lives in the Midwest somewhere that's going to come out and visit you, and you're going to get them for four days. Where are you taking them? The first place everyone wants to go is the beach. Right. So we'll make sure we stop at the beach. I personally love the hiking trail behind uh, the Griffith Observatory. I would probably sneak into Koreatown, uh, where we can get some great food, and lastly, I got to take them to my my hometown uh, within the city of LA then that's San Pedro all right your turn my turn same question so in the valley I would go visit the Japanese gardens absolutely gorgeous um, uh, I'm a big Harry Potter fan as are our kids so I'd probably go into Universal Studios Hollywood you know you've got to go to you know Venice or Hermosa or one of the beach communities and then you know I'd probably land here in downtown and take them to a Kings game at Staples so for Angelinos who want to get out for a staycation yep. or for guests who want to come visit, you can go to discoverlosangeles.com slash comeback and you'll see a listing of special offers from hotels, restaurants, cultural attractions. It's time for us all to you know, safely get out and explore our community again. Absolutely. Did you know May is Arthritis Awareness Month? Channel 35 spoke with Dr. Daniel Arkfeld from the USC Keck School of Medicine about the different types of arthritis and some tips to avoid it. Pretty informative. Take a look. Arthritis is a complex term with very simple origin. People with joint pains have arthritis. Genetics and environment play a key role. Uh, probably about 40% genetic, 60% environment. Uh, for example, your knee pain, if you get knee arthritis, a lot of it's related to, you know, your weight. The most common joint in the whole body for arthritis is the base of the thumb here. And the base of the thumb uh, is what makes us human, the opposing thumb. But that leads into is joint pain. And the base of the thumb is the most arthritis that we do see, which really takes from using it for 50, 60 years, starts to wear out. Regular arthritis, you know, you have knobby bones. You may get like the, the last finger of the uh, the finger be involved called a Heberden node, um, but they get like bony, hard joints. Rheumatoid arthritis comes from the blood and inflammation, and the inflammation settles in a joint and it'll swell up. Avoiding arthritis is a key issue that we're dealing with at this time. Some of the key components in rheumatoid do not to smoke and to keep your dental health doing well. Gingivitis seems to be a very common trigger of inflammation in the joints as well. The other one for osteoarthritis, a lot of it's related to use we're sitting up right on the computer all day, puts a lot of fulcrum point or pain on the base of the neck and the low back. There's a concept of moving. The more you move, the less arthritis you'll have. A lot of people get achy and sore and they stop moving. And that's the worst thing you can do because the blood flow to the joint tends to become sluggish and stiff and people have more and more pain, more and more discomfort, and they really you know, lose their function.
It has made its way across the globe, heralding a message of efficiency, sustainability, and eco-friendly water travel. And it has finally reached the shores of Los Angeles. Channel 35 was on hand to check out Energy Observer, one of the world's first fully functional examples of carbon emission-free travel. You know, I kind of look at hydrogen as this Swiss army knife of, of energy carriers. It has all of these just amazing uh, applications, very diverse applications, and nowhere is it really better demonstrated in this boat. Today, we're partnered with Energy Independence Now and, and the Energy Observer, which is a vessel that relies upon renewable powers and is actually a cogenerate, a floating cogeneration plant that creates its own power and it's all zero carbon output. It's a fully autonomous boat that produces fresh water, renewable electricity, and hydrogen that can keep the boat running indefinitely. Este barco o bote es uno de los primeros y se está introduciendo ahorita porque estamos en una crítica, crítica situación donde tenemos que introducir este tipo de te tecnología para que se use alrededor de los puertos, alrededor de los, de los océanos y, y muchos, muchos lugares alrededor del mundo. It's so important to see all the different uses of hydrogen as an energy storage device because we know batteries have limitations and we need all of the solutions we can to get renewable energy into vehicles. We think so much about them in terms of cars and trucks, but now we can think about them in terms of ships and planes. So it's very important to see these early demonstration projects. And very exciting to see this one. Not everybody can, uh, can plug in somewhere, and so ultimately I think more Americans in particular, but people all over the world, are familiar with going into a station where there's a pump, you take the nozzle out, you put it in your car, you go get a Slurpee, five minutes later you have 300 more miles of range and you drive away, and that's what hydrogen provides you. Once upon a time, there was a small neighborhood market that worked with the LA Food Council to provide healthier food choices for its community. Well, that same neighborhood market, Lupita's Market, is now geared up with new energy-efficient refrigerators, complements of the Healthy Stores Refrigeration Grant Program. Check out their new look. What a delight it is to be here in the first district in Glacelle Park right here at, at Lupita's Market. They are the recipients of a program where we're providing healthy stores refrigeration. It's a program where we obtain grant monies from the state so that we can provide small businesses, local businesses, with new energy efficient refrigeration systems that are custom for their business. Para nosotros poder dispenser de refrigeradores que son demasiado caros. So para nosotros esta oportunidad fue buena. Una porque nos ayudó para pagar menos en la electricidad. Otras porque es algo limpio, más higiénico, más nos ahorró mucho dinero. En esta pandemia ayudando a los pequeños negocios que son más necesitados porque si tú caminas acá hoy, tú no vas a ver donde hay tienditas aquí que tienen cosas aquí frescas. Y esto es bueno para la salud de la comunidad. Y eso es por eso es estamos aquí. Si me entiende, porque nos vamos a ayudar nosotros como vamos a poder ayudar a la comunidad. Lo vamos a mantener la verdura más fresca y luego va a ser algo más limpio y más natural para nosotros. We currently have done about 22 stores throughout the county. By next year we're hoping to reach 80 and to go beyond that for a lot of the small businesses. Is there such a thing as wildfire season? Did you know that California was currently experiencing a drought? Do you know what the wildland urban interface is? Most Angelinos can't answer all three of those questions. Fortunately for our feature this week, Maria Hall Brown sits down with LA Fire Chief Rolf Tarasas, who gives us all the answers to all those questions and many more. Here locally, our snowpack is down by 40% and we're into a second year of a severe drought. And so you know what that means for Los Angeles. Here to tell us how we can protect ourselves and make sure that everything goes well this fire season, I'm delighted to be joined by Fire Chief Ralph Teresa. The threat of fires here in SoCal, how bad is it really? 
Well, Maria, I wish I had some good news. It's, uh, it's going to be bad. It's been bad the last few years. And it's due to three main reasons primarily. It's the drought, which you just mentioned. It's climate change. And the third reason is people are moving into the wildland urban interface. Last year in the state of California, over 4 million acres were burned, which was double the previous record. So we're anticipating another busy year. You can't protect people alone. You need actually to have those that are homeowners or just, you know, citizenry itself be aware and prepared. So what are you hoping that homeowners will do prior to this fire season? First of all, they need to clear their brush, 200 feet minimum. That's the first thing we need our people to do. The second thing is to have an escape plan for your family. You never know where the brush fire is coming from, so have two ways to evacuate if you had to. Extra garden hoses, you know, attached around the house. Does that help you? Well, if there's nothing else, it, it, it is a help. Uh, our hoses are larger diameter and flow a lot more water, but typically when uh, the system is being drained by multiple engines pulling water out of the hydrants, the pressure is very low. I see. But I would encourage people, if you have a hose, uh, to have it ready. Uh, those are, are rubber, and of course they're going to burn, but mm -hmm. sometimes you never know. It might be a tool that you may need. Celebrate Asian Pacific American Heritage Month with the LA Public Library. Learn expressive portraits with artist Siri France and join in for the Teen Racial Diversity Book Club. All this up next on Things to Do. The Central Branch of the Los Angeles Public Library invites you to celebrate Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Join other kids aged 5 to 11 for a fun afternoon of reading and cultural awareness followed by an easy art project. All that's needed to participate is paper, scissors, and whatever you have around the house. Don't miss this free online event. The LA Public Library's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration will happen Thursday, May 27th, beginning at 3 p.m. For more information, go to LAPL.org and check out the events section. If your teenager is an aspiring Picasso or Kahlo, well, listen up. Los Angeles-based artist Siri France will be offering a limited-time course called Expressive Portraits. This class invites young artists to explore expression and emotion in portraiture while learning fundamental drawing techniques. Designed for teens aged 13 to 17, this live Zoom class will help students learn how to create expressive portraiture that evokes story and emotion. Expressive Portraits with Siri France happens Thursdays from 4 to 5.30 p.m., beginning May 27th. For more information on how to enroll, look for the listing on eventbrite.com. The Coenga Branch Library invites her teens to the Teen Racial Diversity Book Club. Join in via Zoom to discuss popular teen literary works that celebrate diversity and deepen our understanding of equity, inclusion, and justice. The book club, run by teens, was created to help other teens discover books written by people of color. Teens ages 13 to 17 are welcome. Be sure to check out the Teen Racial Diversity Book Club, happening Friday, May 28th, beginning at 4 p.m. For more information on how to participate, email mmarone at lapl.org for the Zoom invite. And that's a look at some virtual things to do. That's it for this edition. I'm Natalia Bilbao, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thank you so much for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org, and we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more LA This Week.